I guess it's getting close to that time. Hi, everybody. Hey, Jim. Hi, Jim. Hey, Jim. How you doing? Good. Welcome to the Iron Horse. We're RCBC. It's Redemption Community Biker Church. We're here representing Jesus Christ. I'd like to start this off with some prayer for us. Dear Lord, we ask you to forgive us for everything that we've done that we know about and everything that we've done that we don't know about, Lord. I want to thank you for the blessings you've done that we know about and the blessings that you've done that we have no idea that you have. I ask you to be with us and have the message of Jesus brought out to us, Lord. Keep everybody safe. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. I figure I need that. <laughs> Make sure this voice works a little bit. Yeah, we're here uh, on uh, the third Sunday of every month you know, for full service. There's a complimentary continental breakfast here, too. That's donuts and coffee. Yeah, and uh, on the fourth Sunday, we're at the Boot Hill. That's over on Main Street. And the second Sunday, we're at Ross Myers. We're a swap meeting. Our church services on Saturday night at 10 First Baptist Boulevard. That's down by the swap meeting or flea market or whatever you call that thing over on 415. <laughs> you know. uh, everybody's welcome there. It's totally non-denominational. It's just uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and resurrection of body. We roll on. I'm going to uh, do a couple of traditional type songs that you hear in most churches <laughs> like I usually do. And, <clears throat> and the second one is uh, I have a little story about it before you. Yeah. Just a little warm up to see if I can make this thing work. whether it's going to work or not. <laughs> John, you must have known I was going to do this. <clears throat> he hadn't been here in a while. <laughs> I was laughing when I see him come up. Call it Stormy Monday. Tuesday just as bad. Call it Stormy Monday. Tuesday just as bad. Wednesday is the worst. Ah, but Thursday is oh so sad. Eagle flies on Friday. Saturday, I go out. Eagle flies on Friday. Saturday, I go out. <coughs> Sunday I go to church and get down on my knees and pray. You know what I say? Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for me. I say thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. All mankind would be set free. Praise the Lord.
Call it stormy Monday. Tuesday is just as bad. Call it stormy Monday. But Tuesday is just as bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wednesday's worse. But Thursday's whoa, so. Amen. <laughs> How are you? That's my favorite song, Jim. Hmm? That's my favorite song. <laughs> I know it is. <laughs> That's my last one. I've seen you coming up. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, long way back, I was kind of for the government and uh, I was I was asked to write a song you know, for Easter Sunday and this was on the Friday before Easter <laughs> it was only Saturday and it was Sunday you know? and, you know, and it was I was asked and I was asked for the volunteers to come in to the federal <coughs> institution I was in asked me to do this and uh, it got done, and I actually remembered the words to it and, and everything by Sunday. Now, I don't know how many of you people out there are believers or how many aren't, but those who are believers know how it got done because I'm not a center songwriter. My memory is not the greatest, you know, and, and I wrote it. And it had a lot of feelings for me. And, and the reason I'm talking like I am and carrying on is, is Roller and, uh, and Drifter are off to a prison right now doing just what those volunteers are doing there. And the only reason I say that because it's the only thing I know that I'm here now and talking to you about Jesus Christ was uh, Reverend Danny Burgoyne, who was the chaplain from Grace Chapel in Tucson, Arizona, that came to Pima County Jail and pushed Jesus down my throat and the Bible down my throat. And I threatened to kill him and did everything else until finally I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior in 1982. You know, and that's the only reason I'm here now was because of volunteers. And as my walk with the Lord has been kind of laid on me that, you know, you know, we're supposed to do that. We don't have a choice. You deny me to your friends, I'm gonna deny you to the Father. I mean, there's a lot of things, scriptures for him, that you're supposed to, you know, not hide the gospel. You know, everything you see is you don't hide under a bushel, no, you know, you turn around, let your little light shine. I mean, you go up, you go through it. And you're supposed to do that. That doesn't mean everybody's got to go to jails and to prison to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but your kids should know about Jesus. Your neighbors should know about Jesus. Your wife, your mother, your father, your uncles, your aunts, they should know about Jesus. They should, if you've accepted the Lord, you've got, you've got to you know, get out there and let people know it. It's not something you just keep as a secret. Well, okay, me and Jesus are cool. You know, I'm going to live forever. I'm like the rest of you, you know, you're on your own. It doesn't work that way. You know, and it's kind of led me with, with, with Roller, you know, talking to me about going, kind of led me to, that's why you got it jumped on. <laughs> but that kind of, you know, because that's the only reason I'm here. Because somebody felt like Roland and Drifter did and, and, and went to jail and, and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and it got to me. You know, so all that stuff. And by the way, that also give you a little bit, guess what, I'm not in jail. So yeah, that's not necessarily the jailhouse Jesus. You know, it, 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 it gets real even in jail. And uh, <clears throat> there's a line in this song, it's a garden of souls ready to be picked, waiting for the right, right hand. That's a line in this song. And, you know, that was jail that I was at, it was actually a prison. But, you know, that garden of souls is hospitals, you know, it's prison, it's jail houses, it's battlefields. You know, any place that you you're, you find yourself really at the end of your rope and you're, you're, you're looking for divine invention, that is the garden of souls. 
you know, so there's a lot of places people can do rest homes. A lot, lot of places out there that, that really need it. So if anybody feels in the mood to go out and volunteer to go see somebody that's, you know, that's in need, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea. It's a real nice feeling when you know someone cares and you're not all alone and yourself. Christians of the world, they take time out of their life to stop by and give a little help. You know, the Lord, He's been working in places just like this since back. Back when time first began, it's a garden of souls ready to be fed, waiting for the right, right hand. Thank God for Christian, for He made them worth. Son Jesus Christ, we need more Christians. Oh, to spread the word of God so that all, all mankind might see the light. On a cross at Calvary, a long, long time ago. Where his son gave his life for our sin, spreading the word is a mission of our faith. For he's not gonna do it again. Thank God for Christians, for he made them. In the image of his son, Jesus Christ, we need more Christians. I'll spread the word of God so that all, all mankind might see the light. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Frankie. Just calm it down, okay? <laughs> calm it down a little bit. Oh, <laughs> well, before we get going, let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we praise you. We love you. Lord, we thank you for all you do in our lives. We pray this morning that you would bring your word to us. Make it real in our lives. Push away the distractions. Help us to focus on what you'd have us to learn. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to start with uh, two words that are not popular in today's society. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I don't know when that became a bad thing, but, uh, but it's happened. There are too many places nowadays where you're supposed to say happy holidays. But praise God, this isn't one of them. Amen? <laughs> but it's that time of year. It's, uh, we're singing Christmas carols already, and people are in the stores buying presents, and most of us have our trees up. Everybody got their tree up? Yep. Yeah. You know, if you come around next Saturday, I'm going to teach you what the tree means and what it's there for. A lot of people don't even know that. But, uh... The buzz is around, isn't it? I mean, we live in Florida and the, the sun's out, but the Christmas buzz is still here. We may not have snow, but we still have lights. 
And uh, we come to church before Christmas to hear that Christmas story read. And to celebrate the birth of our Savior. And you know, we should do that. We should do that. And we should make a big deal out of Christ's birth. And we should be excited about the season. And this morning's message will have a little bit of a, a different twist on the normal Christmas sermon. We're going to dive a little bit deeper than we normally do into the meaning of Christmas. But before we get going, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read out of Luke chapter 2 which is probably the most famous story that's read at Christmas time. And uh, it's starting in verse 1. It says, At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And when they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him in snugly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on peace on earth, to those with whom God is pleased. You guys have heard that probably in different versions of the Bible read, right? You've heard it before? And... Uh, you know, it's a great story. It, it, if you've heard it read when you were younger, it gives you that warm feeling inside the pit of your stomach. You know, hey, I, I remember Christmas time, right? Anybody from up north? Yep. Reminds you of the fall festivals, right? And the, and the, uh, the gathering of crops. And I can't help but think that all over the country today, this story is being read in thousands of other churches. Because it's a wonderful story. It's a really neat story. But the bad part is, after this story is read, and then a couple days from now, 11 days from now, people take down their lights, and they take down their trees, and they put the nativity scene in the box until next year, and that's what they know about Jesus. That's what they know. They put Jesus in a box and they take him out next year around the same time. And it's because in today's culture, that's the end of the Christmas story. All the presents are open. We put the tree out by the curb, right? And we'll do it again next year. And the story ends with baby Jesus lying in a manger, right? I mean, that's what our country celebrates. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the story didn't end there. There's a lot more to this story. All around this great country of ours, and I do mean great, there are nativity scenes in people's yards. And what do they show, right? They have three wise men, Mary and Joseph, maybe some sheep and some shepherds, maybe a camel if you're lucky, right? And then there's a baby lying in a manger. You know, I was in my 30s before I knew what a manger was. Anybody else? I thought it was a like a scene. You know, I was like, hey, there's a manger. And, and I didn't know that it was actually a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. But that's the only image a lot of Americans have for Christmas. That's all they're taught. And they put it... 
in the box for next year. And, and they don't see, at least not consciously, that Jesus grew up. He lived to be 33 and a half years old before he was crucified. He's living a lot longer than that now. But uh, that's, that's when he left this earth. They don't see that Jesus lived a perfect life on earth without sin so that he could be sacrificed for our sins. That's why he lived. He wasn't there for just the Christmas story. People don't see the torture and the horrible death he went through for our sins so that we could spend eternity with him. That's not part of the Christmas story, right? That would be a miserable Christmas story, right? Yeah. If, if that's what they showed. But, but that's the story. It's not just a baby in a feeding trough. And then when we, we see the torture story and the, the horrible death, that's Easter, right? But we pretty that up with bunnies and eggs, right? Yep. Folks, listen, that's all the same story. That's the same story. And we as a church have to help people to learn this story and to link those two events. Because otherwise... It's getting lost. It's getting lost. Otherwise, Jesus will never be anything more than a lot of people than the baby in the manger at the mall. They don't really understand the story. They just understand that there was a baby and he was born and there were shepherds and they smelled like sheep and there was a star, right? That's, that's what we know. And his name isn't just Jesus. It's Jesus, the Christ. A lot of people think that Jesus' last name was Christ. No, it wasn't. Okay? It's Jesus, the Christ. And Christ means Messiah. That's what the word means, is Messiah. And in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 17, it says, When Jesus came to the region of, of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Basically, he's looking at the guys that have been hanging around him, and he says, who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. They thought he was somebody come back from the dead. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. See, Jesus means a lot more than presents under the tree. But those presents are a symbol of his gift to us. But people don't put that together because we don't talk about it nowadays. The whole idea behind presence is to represent the gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ gave. The tree is the tree he was hung on. The star is the star that shows where Jesus was. Isn't that crazy? It's not taught today. The, the lights on the tree are meant to represent the stars and then the one star were to follow. And underneath the tree, you find Jesus, which is where the gifts are. That's crazy that it's not taught, but that's what Jesus is. He's the Messiah. In Luke 24, verses 1 through 7, it says, But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb. This is after he was crucified. Taking the spices they had prepared. You know why they took spices? Because dead bodies stink. They were going to cover up the smell with the spices. They found the stone that had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there puzzled. And two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified, bowed their faces to the ground. Then the man asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who's alive? They didn't believe that he was going to rise, even though he told them. They said, he isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember when he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands 
of sinful men and be crucified and then he would rise again on the third day. He is the Messiah. And you know how we know that? Because he came back from the dead. Anybody else? Anybody seen that? Yeah? Anybody? Anybody come back from the dead here? No. You see, without the resurrection, Jesus didn't matter. Acts 2 Verses 32 through 36. Listen to this. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand because he is the Messiah. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out among us, just as you see in here today. The Holy Spirit is what puts the need for God and the desire to do good things inside of us. And we only have that because Jesus left. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor on my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Folks, these things were written thousands of years ago. But they came true. The Christmas story doesn't end when we put away our decorations. You know, it's funny. People tell me, well, Jesus, how do you know Jesus existed? And I said, because every calendar in the world is based off of his birth. There's something special about that. He's a special guy. How do you know he existed? Because thousands of years, his book is still the best seller out there. Amen. This book changes lives. And that manger, the feeding trough we talked about, he's not in there anymore. Although this season, that's where we see him as a baby. He's not a baby. Jesus Christ overcame this world in death. And now he is at the right hand of the Father. And that's our only hope for this world. That is our only hope for this world. Because none of us are getting out alive. I don't know if you figured that out or not yet. During this time, there are a lot of people who observe Advent. Have you heard of Advent before? Yep. You might have heard the word. Advent is a Latin word. It simply means coming. And during Advent, people light candles and they read scriptures out of Isaiah to talk about the coming Messiah. And Jews did that years ago. But those prophecies were about the coming Messiah. Guess what? He already came. Not many people understand that Advent, when we talk about Christmas time, is only the first Advent. It's only the first one. The story of the coming Messiah. But there's a second advent. The Bible talks about that in Matthew 24. We're not going to read it. It's not a pleasant story. And if you're not a Christian, the second advent is not a story that will give you a warm feeling. It talks about what's going to happen in this world. And it's amazing as how the years go on, it starts to resemble what it says in the Bible. And the prophecies... Of the Middle East. It's like, huh. The Middle East shouldn't be anything. But yet, it's the focus of our world. Why? Because there's something special about it. You know? The second advent is when Jesus returns to get his people, the church, us. Those of us who have accepted him as Lord and Savior. And if we're dead, we're going to be rised up, risen up to go with him regardless. Our bodies. Scripture tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we know that when we leave this earth, one second after we're gone, we're either going to be with Him or we're going to be in another place that people don't like to talk about today. But the reality is that's what the Christmas story is. That's what it's about. It's not about shopping malls. <laughs> it's not about decorations. It's not about blow up dolls in the front of your house, even though those things are fun and there's nothing wrong with them, 
I'm not condemning it. I, I love that we celebrate Christmas in the way we do it. But that's not what it's about. The whole idea is so that we understand why he came. And today's lesson can be summed up pretty easy. Jesus, the Christ, was born to a virgin in a manger. That was the first advent. That's when he came. He grew up to be a man who was perfect and without sin while he was on earth. He was crucified, and he bore every one of our sins and died a horrible death so that we could be set free from our sins. You see, Jews in the Old Testament, if you read it, they sacrificed innocent animals because it says without the shedding of innocent blood, there is no remission of sins. Something has to pay for that sin. Yeah. And that's what Jesus was for us. He was the ultimate sacrifice because he was perfect. He overcame death and he was resurrected. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And you know what? He's coming back. And people are either going to be happy to see him, or they're going to say, oh crap, I was wrong. The Bible tells us that we will see him when he returns as far as from the east is from the west. He's going to light up the sky all over the world when he comes back. And that's the second advent. Folks, as I said before, the, the Christmas story is a wonderful story. It is. And there are people all over our country celebrating, actually all over the world right now celebrating it. But here's the truth, just so you know. Jesus wasn't born in December. <laughs> if, you, if you do... Your history, we, we think that he was born in uh, August or September time frame, okay? And when the wise men came, he wasn't a baby in a manger. He was about two and a half, <coughs> all right? But it's a neat little package that we put it into um, so that people will understand what happened. And, and the reason why it's celebrated in December is because there was a pagan holiday in December that was celebrated at the same time and Christians could celebrate it without being discovered because there was a time when Christians had to hide their faith. So when people ask you those questions, that's how you know. Because a lot of people tell me, do you know Christ, uh, Christmas is a pagan holiday? Absolutely. Do you know why? Uh, never mind. I don't want to talk to you anymore. This is an excellent time to talk about what that really means and to tell people what this story is so that people understand because it's out of love. Like Jim said, you know, Christians are there to tell other people. That's the whole point. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm a creature. And luckily, amen, and luckily somebody told me and I told you before, if, if you'd have told me 20 years ago that I'd be up here preaching on a Sunday morning, I'd have told you to get your head checked. But here I am. And that's the power of our Savior. Amen. We ought to do it out of love and concern for those that don't know Jesus. We need to teach him, them that he's no longer just a baby in a manger. And we need to teach them that the first advent is only the beginning of the story. I pray that each one of you will have a Merry Christmas and that Christ will be glorified in all of your lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and how it teaches us who you are and what you did for us. I just pray as we go into the season that we learn more about you. We honor and glorify you for you are the reason for this season. And that we don't get caught up in the commercialism of Christmas, but to recognize what it's all about. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Glad you guys are all here this morning. <laughs>